This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. This is Rick Renner and I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to return to our series on the Apostles' Creed. You might say, Rick, why are you teaching the Apostles' Creed? Well, when the Apostles' Creed was first compiled, it was at a moment when a lot of false doctrine was emerging in the church. And they took the earliest teaching of the Apostles and condensed them and made the Apostles' Creed kind of as a truth filter to determine what was and was not authentic Christian teaching. Well, we're living in a day, again, when there's all kinds of teaching out there on the internet, on YouTube, ay, 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 some of it's right, some of it's wrong, and guess what? We still need the Apostles' Creed as a truth filter to help us know what is right and what is not right. And we need to know what are the basic tenets of the Christian faith, and all of that is in the Apostles' Creed. I've wanted to teach this for years, and here we are, finally teaching it, and today's going to really be good. But I want you to order the whole series. It's 15 parts, and it comes with a study guide so that you can read everything we're discussing while you see or hear the whole series. And right now we're offering you a bundle of books. Now you can order them all together or you can all order them one at a time. The first is Paid in Full. It's a great book for you to be reading as we get ready for Easter. The subtitle says An In-Depth Look at the Defining Moments of Christ's Passion. The next book is called Build Your Foundation, Six Must-Have Beliefs for Constructing an Unshakable Christian Life. And I know that you want an unshakable Christian life, so you need to know how to build your foundation. And then we're offering you my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy. Ay, 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 we're living in a day when it seems the world has gone crazy. And friends, you and I need to keep our head on straight. And that's why I wrote this book. You need it. Your kids need it. Your grandkids need it. And I really want to encourage you to order yours today. And when you become a partner with our ministry, we're going to send you two books as our way of saying welcome to our partner family. We're going to send you my book, which is called Life in the Combat Zone. The subtitle says How to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. And this book is dedicated to partners. So we always give this book to anyone who becomes a partner with the ministry. And we also send new partners Denise's book, which is called The Gift of forgiveness. These two books are part of our welcome package to say welcome to our partner family. And right now for free, you can go to our website and download the Apostles' Creed and just print it on your home printer. If you don't have a home printer, then call us or write us and we'll slip one of these in the mail to you. And when you get it, you can frame it like I have framed mine. I love to read the Apostles' Creed. It is the oldest creed of the church outside of the New Testament and it very well states what we believe and we need to be reminded regularly about what our faith is. And that's why I want you to have a copy of the Apostles' Creed. But when you reach out to us, let us know how to pray for you. We're praying people, and we really want to pray for Jesus to do something miraculous in your life, and He will. But let us know how to pray so we can put our faith together with yours. But I'll be back in just a moment. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Today we're going to return to the Apostles' Creed and move to the next point. But let's remind ourselves what the Apostles' Creed is. The Apostles' Creed dates to the year 140 A.D. and the oldest version was called the Old Roman Creed. But the form that we use today is a form that was devised in the year 390 A.D. And the early church fathers called this form, the Apostles' Creed, the Rule of Faith. It was the rule they used to state what we believe. And really, it was a condensed compilation of the teachings of the apostles. And that's why we call it the Apostles' Creed. And the Apostles' Creed covers, listen, the core beliefs of the Christian faith. And the early church used it like a truth filter to determine what was and wasn't genuine Christian doctrine. And today, the Apostles' Creed is still quoted in churches all over the world, including my own church, 
in the city of Moscow, Russia. We are a church that is compiled of people from various backgrounds, some educated, some uneducated, some with theological studies, some with none whatsoever. Most of the people in our church were pagan. They were atheists because they grew up in the Soviet Union. They did not believe in God. And so they need to know what we believe. And to make sure we're all on the same page, every week as a part of our worship service, we pause and corporately all together, we recite out loud the Apostles' Creed as a statement of what we believe. And here is the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father all Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. We've already covered that. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. We've already covered that. Who was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. We covered that in the last program. Today, we're going to see this point, who suffered under Pontius Pilate. You may say, why is that important? Because when the Apostles' Creed was composed, the legal documents were still available to prove this really took place. But He also was crucified, died, and was buried. We're going to be looking at that tomorrow. He descended into hell. That's a fact that many people today question, but it's even a part of the Apostles' Creed. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from whence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And in our own church, by the time that we get to amen, the whole church just says it with faith. Amen. This really is a statement of what we believe. But today we're going to look at that point. I believe he suffered under Pontius Pilate. And again, at the time that the Apostles' Creed was compiled, they could still verify the legal documents proving that Jesus really did suffer under Pontius Pilate. But let's talk about the environment when Jesus' public ministry took place. At the time that Jesus' ministry on earth was occurring, Israel was filled with paranoid leaders who were obsessed with holding on to the reins of power. And the political leaders who had been installed by Rome were looking behind every nook and cranny for opponents, and they were constantly struggling to keep their grip on power. And Israel despised the Romans for several reasons. Number one, for pushing the Roman language and their culture on them and for requiring them to pay taxes to Rome. But because of political turmoil in Israel at that time, very few installed Roman political leaders held power for very long. And those who did, did it by using cruelty and real brutality. And the ability to rule long required a ruthless leader who was willing to do anything necessary to maintain power. And this leads us to Pontius Pilate, who was just that kind of of man. It was normal for a Roman governor to rule between 12 and 36 months in Israel. But Pilate ruled for, are you ready? 10 years. He ruled from 26 AD to 36 AD. And that means the entire 10 year span that he was ruling. He was governor of Judah during the time of Jesus public ministry. And the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus wrote that Pilate was ruthless He was unsympathetic and failed to appreciate how important the Jews' religious beliefs and convictions were to them. But in addition to being the governor, Pilate was also the highest legal authority in the land. He held the supreme authority in all legal matters. And as the highest expert in Roman law, he had the final say-so in nearly all legal decisions. But when a case came up that had to do with religious matters, he didn't like that. So So he usually referred that to the Sanhedrin. But Pilate actually did not live in the city of Jerusalem, but he came to Jerusalem during the time of big feasts with a whole big group of soldiers to make sure that peace was maintained in the population in the city of Jerusalem. And that is why Pilate was in the city of Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. But as a political man, Pilate knew how to play political games. But a day came when the high priest and the Sanhedrin and a huge mob insisted that Pilate crucify 
Jesus, and Pilate wanted to know the reason for this demand. So they answered him in Luke chapter 23, verse 2. We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. Well, Pilate knew the truth was the Jews were jealous of Jesus, but politically the charges which they brought against Jesus put Pilate in a really bad position. What if news reached Rome that Jesus perverted the nation and taught the people to withhold their taxes or that he claimed to be a counter king and Pilate did nothing about it? It would be political suicide for Pilate to do nothing. And the Jewish leaders knew exactly what strings to pull, and they were pulling every string in their hands to get Pilate to do what they wanted him to do. So with all of that behind us about Pilate and the environment of that time, now let's go to Matthew 27, verse 2, where the Bible says, And when they had bound him, referring to Jesus, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. When the Bible says they bound him, it is the very word which is used to describe a rope that is wrapped around the neck of an animal. Then it goes on to say they led him away. The Greek word epago, also an agricultural term used to describe a farmer who wraps a rope around the neck of a sheep and leads him somewhere. And this agrees with Isaiah chapter 53, which says he was led like a sheep to his own slaughter. But the rope was slipped around his neck and the religious leaders delivered him to Pilate. And when we come to Matthew chapter 27, verse 2, it says they delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. The word delivered is a form of the Greek word paradidomi, which means when the high priest ordered Jesus to be taken to Pilate, they made Jesus Pilate's problem. They literally delivered him or handed him over to Pilate. And the high priest delivered him fully into Pilate's hands and then left Pilate with the responsibility to find Jesus guilty and to crucify him. And in Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, the Bible says, and Jesus stood before the governor, that's Pilate, and the governor asked him, saying, art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, thou sayest. Now, please pay attention to this. This is really important. Pilate asked Jesus a direct question, but Jesus refused to directly answer him. You're going to find out in a moment why that is really significant. Then in Matthew 27, 12, the Bible says, and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, he answered nothing. Now for a second time, a second time, Jesus refused to answer or to refute the charges that had been brought against him. And when you come to Matthew 27, 13 and 14, the Bible says, then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou not how many things they witness against thee? And he answered him to never a word, insomuch that the governor, that is Pilate, marveled greatly. And the word marveled greatly is the Greek word thalmadzo, which means to wonder, to be at a loss of words, or to be shocked and amazed almost at the point of being speechless. Pilate was absolutely dumbfounded by Jesus' silence because Roman law gave prisoners three chances to defend themselves. And if a prisoner passed up those three chances and refused to speak in his own defense, he would automatically be charged as guilty. And Pilate knew that. But in Matthew 27, 11, Jesus passed up his first chance. In Matthew 27, 12, he passed up his third chance. And now he's passed up his next chance. Pilate asked him in Luke 23, 3, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, Thou sayest that Jesus refused to directly answer the question. And in doing so, he passed up his third chance to defend himself. And naturally speaking, he should have automatically been charged as guilty. But Pilate did not want to crucify him. And in Luke chapter 23, verse 4, Pilate said to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in this man. And in John 19, 12, we read, and from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But in Luke 23, 14 to 16, we read that Pilate also said, you brought this man unto me as one that perverteth the people. And behold, I, having examined him before you, have found no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse him. I will therefore chastise him 
and release him. But notice that word examined. In Greek, it is the word anachrisis. The word ana means to do something again and again. The word crisis is from krino, which means to judicially examine or to ju judicially judge. When you put it together, it means I have closely examined him. I've scrutinized him. I've judged him judicially. And you have to remember that Pilate was the highest legal authority of the land. And from simply a judicial viewpoint, he couldn't find a single crime that Jesus had committed. And from a legal standpoint, Jesus was not guilty. So in Luke 23, Verse 20 and 21, Pilate, therefore willing to release Jesus, spake to them again. But they cried out, saying, crucify him, crucify him. The words cried out is a form of the Greek word epiphaneo. It means to shout, to scream, to yell, to shriek, or to screech. And the tense means they were hysterically screaming and shrieking at the top of their voices, totally out of control and without pause. So Pilate tried to appeal to them again. We read that in Luke 23, verse 22. Why? What evil hath he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. But Luke 23, 23 says that they were instant with their loud voices requiring that he might be crucified. And finally, we read in Luke 27, verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, see ye to it. Well, in Bible times, the washing of one's hands was used symbolically to say, I have no guilt in this matter. But when you come to Matthew 27, verse 26, the Bible says Pilate had Jesus scourged. Well, the scourge was one of the most horrific weapons in the entire ancient world. In fact, the mere threat of a scourge could calm a crowd or bend the will of the strongest rebel. This was a terrifying weapon. And according to Jewish law, in Deuteronomy 25, verse 3, the Jews were permitted to give a victim 40 lashes. But because the Jews wanted to pretend they were merciful, they usually only gave 39. But when Jesus was scourged, he was scourged by Romans, and the Romans had no such limitation. There was no limitation as to the number of stripes they could lay upon his body. And when we read Matthew chapter 27, verse 26, it says, And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. My friends, before Jesus was ever crucified, he already had been completely scourged. His body had bore the brunt of that scourge as they ripped the flesh from his body. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And listen to this. And with his stripes, we are healed. Jesus was scourged and every stripe that was laid across his body was for your physical and mental and emotionally healing. And my friends, that is why it is the will of God to heal you in every area of your life. Why should you go on being sick when Jesus paid the price for you to be well? Isaiah 53, 5 clearly says, and with his stripes, we are healed healed. And when you come to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, the apostle Paul even wrote about Jesus standing before Pontius Pilate. He said, Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, which means Jesus never jeopardized the truth of who he was. He never denied who he was. He just maintained a good confession. He knew who he was, even in the face of political opposition, even before Pontius Pilate. But Pilate is not mentioned again in the New Testament, but historical records tell us that some kind of accusation that was very serious was brought against Pilate in the year 36 AD. And that charge was so serious that it resulted in his removal from office and exile to Gaul, which is modern day France. But Eusebius, the well-known early Christian historian later wrote, the Pilate fell into real trouble during the time of the emperor Caligula and lost many privileges. And Eusebius wrote that Pilate who ruled Judea ruthlessly and mercilessly for 10 years, 
and who was responsible for the trial, the judgment, the crucifixion, and the burial of Jesus, finally committed suicide. That's what we know of the end of Pontius Pilate. But it's very important that this statement about Jesus suffering before Pontius Pilate is included in the Apostles' Creed because this is legal proof that this really occurred. There was documentation to show that Jesus really suffered before Pontius Pilate, and this is a very important part of our faith because it proves this really happened. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. Every week, churches around the world quote the Apostles' Creed, but they often don't stop to really think about what they're saying or what the words mean. So for many years, Rick wanted to teach every single point in the Apostles' Creed to help people understand these powerful truths. Finally, it's done. Rick says the Apostles' Creed contains the non-negotiable tenets of the Christian faith. And by studying every point and backing it up with teaching from the New Testament, this series will really anchor believers in what they believe. I studied intensively for this series, and it's like a banquet set on the table for anyone who wants to pull up a chair and partake of these powerful truths. I've done all the work for them. This 15-part series is available in digital and physical formats starting at just $24. We're also offering three of Rick's insightful books that you can order as a package for a discounted price of $45. This bundle includes Paid in Full, Rick's book on the moments leading up to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Build Your Foundation, a powerful book outlining six must-have beliefs to build an unshakable life and how to keep your head on straight in a world gone crazy. An essential book needed to navigate this season in a last day's world that seems to have lost its mind. Don't miss this special offer, this series, The Apostles' Creed, and this must-have book bundle. We also invite you to go to renner.org to download for free a beautifully designed copy of the Apostles' Creed. Call the number on your screen or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner and today I want to give you a report about what's happening in the construction of our new studio work still continues. It's taken a little bit longer than we anticipated because of all the sanctions that have stopped materials from coming to Russia, but we're doing it step by step. And today they're installing the fireplace, which is going to be the centerpiece of this big room where we're going to be filming programs. But in addition to this, there's gonna be another set over here and another set over there. So many angles and opportunities to film teaching that people can trust in this room. But of course, this is just one room. But I have to tell you, I'm pretty excited about this room. To think that TV programs with the Word of God are going to be filmed right here. And when I look around this room, you can see this electrical grid, grid that's gonna hold all the lights. It's on electrical pulleys, so it goes up, it goes down. It's just going to have everything we need to film the teaching of the Word of God. But hey, there's more than this. Let me show you. Well, I know you can't tell from what it looks like right now, but this really is gonna be one of the smaller studios, and this is gonna be Denise's studio, because Denise is reaching women everywhere with her programming. And right from this spot, Denise is going to be sending her teaching to women all over the world. But hey, there's another set in addition to this one. This is our third studio in this new building. You may say, why do you need three studios? Because we're filming a lot of programs. Right now, we can only film one program at a time. We have to set it up, take it down, but this will enable us to do multiple things at one time. We need to do a lot of teaching because there's a lot of people for us to reach. And we're so excited that God has given us three studios. And I wanna say thank you to you, dear partners, that you have helped all of this come about. But on both floors of this building, there are multiple offices. In fact, there are 18 offices. And in all of these offices, people are going to be doing editing, writing, producing programs, working with our network. It is amazing the activity that's going to take place in this building. And it's not about buildings, it's about people. People need the teaching of the Word of God. And I wanna say thank you to you for everything you have already done to help us. And I wanna say thank you for continuing to help us so we can finish this project. 
And together, we can really impact other people's lives. So thank you in advance for everything you're going to continue to do to help us. But it's your generous gifts that have helped us to build this and we will complete it. But right now we're in phase three of our ministry, which is paying off our Tulsa ministry headquarters. We wanna pay it off because the moment it's paid off, all of those funds will be released for us to broadcast the teaching of the Word of God around the world. And that's really our goal, to get the gospel and to teach people the Bible all over the world. They're just crying out for it, and they're waiting for that signal to come with the answer that they've been seeking. So please help us as we finish phase three to pay off the Tulsa facility. We have covered a lot of information today about Jesus suffering before Pontius Pilate. And this fact is a part of the Apostles' Creed, and that's what I'm teaching. The Apostles' Creed, which is 15 parts, it comes in all kinds of formats with a wonderful study guide. Please order this. It will really strengthen your faith to see point by point what we believe in the Christian faith. And right now we're offering you a bundle of books. You can order them as a bundle or you can order them one by one. The first book is called Paid in Full, an in-depth look at the defining moments of Christ's passion. It'd be great for you to read this as you get ready for Easter. We're also offering you my book, which is called Build Your Foundation. Six, must have beliefs for constructing an unshakable Christian life. I know that you want an unshakable Christian life, so you need to be built on these six must have beliefs. Please order this. And we're offering you my book, which is called How to Keep Your Head on Straight in a World Gone Crazy, Developing Discernment for These Last Days. You really need to read this book. And right now we're also sending in the mail to anybody who requests it, the Apostles' Creed. Actually, you can go to our website and download it and just print it at home. But if you don't have a home printer, reach out to us and we'll slip it in the mail to you. And when you get it, you can frame it like I have framed mine. But when you reach out to us, also let us know how to pray for you. And I want to pray for you right now. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that our faith is established on a firm foundation. It's real. It is verifiable. Thank you for this, Father. Oh, we're so grateful for our most holy faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tomorrow we're going to pick up right here and move to the next point of the Apostles' Creed. Don't miss tomorrow. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.